So today is Tuesday. We we had a couple of examples from, um, I think it was a couple of homework problems, right? From 1.4 and 1.5 that we didn't get to. So we'll start with those first. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start with 1.7. Now 1.7 is new information. If you have never seen this stuff before, of course, um, it's new stuff, but it's not too, too difficult, okay? So we will get to that. Hopefully we can finish all of 1.7. If not, we can always, you know, push a little bit over into Wednesday. And hopefully at least by the end of Thursday, we'll have covered all the sections thoroughly and then talk about that review, okay? The test is not going to be scheduled until that Monday. So I set the deadline for the homework the night before the test, okay? So the homework will all be due that Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. And then the test will be that Monday, okay? It's on 27th, yeah. I think, let's go check. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's 27. Okay, so let me go ahead and go into the module so I can get into the 1.4 assignment and we can go look at those last two problems. I believe it was, it might have been two or three. Actually, it was two of them, nine and 10. Yeah, we did that weird box one the last time. So, let me grab a piece of blank paper. It's not really blank, but I'm going to write on the back of it. And Let's see. So it says, use the position equation given below where S represents the height of the object in feet. And it has like V, but then a subscript where it's like lower, it's like the opposite of an exponent, right? The exponent is a superscript, which means it's written like up top. This one has a zero written down below. Um, the way we say it is V naught, K-N-O-T, okay? And that just means like the initial velocity. So if you hear me say V naught, it means V with a little subscript of zero, okay? And that represents your initial velocity. So like the starting velocity, like how fast was it going at the very beginning, okay? Um, and then that's measured in feet per second. And then S naught represents the initial height. So how high was the object before it started getting um, thrown, right? And then T represents the time in seconds as the model for the problem. So I'm gonna write that number, that equation down, number nine. And then it says, you can drop a coin from the top of a building. The building has a height of one, I'm writing the word height, sorry, <laughs> one zero four six feet. And then part A says, use the position equation to write a mathematical model for the height of the coin. Now, if you're dropping the coin, okay, does it have an initial velocity? If you're just, you have it and then you're letting it go. Does it have an initial force, I should say? No, because you didn't throw it down, right? <laughs> that would cause it to have a certain speed as it's going down. You just literally let it go. So when you do that, that means that the initial velocity or initial speed would be zero feet per second, okay? So if I know that the initial height is the height of the building where I dropped the coin is 1,046 feet, and I know that the initial velocity or speed is zero feet per second, this represents the S naught, and this sounds like snot, right? <laughs> and then this one represents D naught, okay? So I do know which numbers exactly to plug into that equation, okay? So I'm literally just going to take this equation for part A and plug in that initial velocity, which was zero, 
and the initial height, which was one or 1046. Now I can clean that up a little bit because if it's zero T, do I really need to write the T? No, right? So we can just write 16 T squared plus um, 1046. And so that's all they need. I think that was all they asked us was just the equation in that first part. I'll we'll double check in just a second once you guys have written this down. Okay. Is everybody doing okay? Thought I'd ask. Everybody okay? You okay? You doing good? Okay. Good, good, good. I'm tired as always, but I'm going. <laughs> Do my thing. Okay, so part B says find the height of the coin after t seconds. Well, I know I didn't, I said t seconds, but the reason why I said t seconds is because if you go up here, t is the one that's measured in seconds, right? So that's why I know that the six seconds represents t. Okay. So I'm going to say t equals six for part b. And I'm going to go back to my paper. And all I have to do is what? What do you think I need to do with that? Mm -hmm. So we're going to go negative 16 times 6 squared, and there's no other t, so I don't need to put any other extra 6 over here. Okay. So let's see what we get. I can plug that whole thing in my calculator. And I get 470. So after 6 seconds, this coin would be at 470 feet. which makes sense. I mean, that's probably how long it's gonna take a coin to fall, right? Takes a little while, especially from a thousand feet up high, right? Okay, let's go look at part C and see what that says. So part C says, how long does it take for the coin to strike the ground? Okay, so I don't like the word strike, but I, Put the word hit in thing. <laughs> Normally, these words, these uh, word problems always say hit the ground. This one decided to be different and said strike the ground. But if the coin is hitting the ground, then what is the height of that coin if it's hitting the ground? It's zero, which means that my S is going to equal zero. So they're basically asking me when does S equal zero? Well, in order for me to do that, I have to take my original equation and I have to set the S equal to zero. So that means it becomes zero equals negative 16 T squared plus 1046 and so on. Now we know three different ways, actually kind of four different ways, but really the other one's the same. So there's extracting roots, there's the quadratic formula that we learned the last time, right? And then there's the factoring. If you look at this, which one does your brain naturally want to do? Because you have three choices and all three of them are perfectly okay to do. And all y'all are probably going to choose different things on the test. That's okay. <laughs> as long as you do any of those three things correctly, you'll get all your points, okay? But which one would you do? Which method would you apply to solve this equation? Extracting roots, factoring, or quadratic formula? I don't want to solve it three different ways. Do you want me to solve it three different ways? <laughs> Can somebody pick one? <laughs> factoring? OK. If I'm factoring, ooh, that might not work. Let's put a little line over here. So if I'm factoring, I have to factor out a negative because the front guy is negative, right? And then what can go into both of those numbers? Let's 
B of 16 will go into this number? I have no idea. It does not. Let's see if maybe four will go, or I think eight, right, is the next biggest number that goes into 16. So divide by eight. No. Divided by four. No. Well, I definitely know it can be divided by two. Yeah. So we get eight T squared minus five, two, three. So I tried doing factoring, but you'll notice that this should be the difference of two squares, right? But this is not a perfect square and that's not a perfect square. So I can't continue anymore with trying to do it by factoring. Give me another option, we tried, it didn't work. I could do quadratic formula, I'm not gonna do it. I could do quadratic formula. If I did, what is A? negative 16, what is B and what is C? B is zero because there's no T in the whole thing, right? If you look up here, the T was there and what was in front of it? A zero, right? Okay, what about C? 1046. And so you could plug these three numbers into your quadratic formula and get your answer that way, okay? I'm not gonna do that because the fastest way to do this is the extracting roots. Why is that the fastest? Because if the only variable you have is t squared or x squared or whatever squared, if that's the only variable in the whole equation, extracting roots is gonna be your fastest way, okay? Even if it's an entire expression squared, even if I had something like this, I don't know, I just made up something, okay? The fact that I have an expression squared and that's all I have throughout the whole problem, extracting roots is gonna be the fastest way to solve that guy, okay? So because I have a T squared there, that's gonna be my fastest way to do it. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna subtract this 1046 over and I get negative 1046 on the left-hand side, it's gone on that side. I'm gonna divide by my negative 16. I know it's not gonna go in nice because we already did it in the calculator, right? And we got 65.375. And what's a negative divided by a negative? A positive. So I didn't do the signs in here, but that's okay. You can do the numbers and the signs later, right? Okay, now I need to do the extracting roots part. I like to use a color here because I'm throwing in a square root, right? When you throw in the square root, you have to put the plus or minus. So the square root of 65.375 is not going to be pretty, but it's okay. Um, it has some more decimals, but I'm not going to write them all. Now, does it make sense for us to have a negative answer? It's time, right? We're not going back in time. You can't do that yet, right? That we know of. Okay, so the time, the negative one doesn't make sense for us. So then we know that it has to be t equal to positive 0 0.854. Now, I'm going to go see how it wants me to type in my answer because I don't know if it wants me to round. It does say round to two decimal places. So then for my number, this five will make that go up for me. So it's actually going to be 8.09. And if I had done quadratic formula, I said I wasn't gonna do it, but I just wanna prove a point. <laughs> Let's see. Negative B, which is zero, plus or minus B squared minus four A. You don't have to write this down. I am just trying to prove a point, okay? Supposedly, I'm supposed to get the same answer then, right? Because it doesn't matter what method you do, as long as you do it correctly, you're gonna get the same answers, okay? This is the only one that was hard because I couldn't use a formula. And you can't factor that by AC method because there's not even a term in the middle, okay? Um, so I'm going to get negative zero is just zero. And then zero, let's put that all in the calculator. So zero squared minus four, negative 16, 1046. And I get this weird number all over negative 32. I get plus or minus, what is the square root of that thing? 
258.735 something or another divided by negative 32. Now be careful. What happens when you do a negative divided by a negative? What do you get? Positive. What happens when you do a positive divided by a negative? You get negative. Notice I didn't put anything in the front because there's nothing there, right? Okay. But you still get plus or minus even though you have a negative downstairs. Really, a lot of the books will do this and they'll say negative and then a plus down here. This is the same symbol as plus or minus. The reason why they write it like that is because to let you know that that negative swapped that sign to a negative and it swapped this sign to a positive, okay? But you can just write it the normal way because in your answers in the boxes, you can't type in this symbol. It doesn't allow you to. That's completely informal, okay? But I noticed that some of the books do that just to let you know that the sign swapped, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that answer and I'm gonna divide it by 32 because I already know what the signs are gonna be. And I get that exact same answer that we had before, did I? Okay? So it doesn't matter which method you choose. If you like quadratic formula, go for it, have at it. If you just wanna do the extracting roots because the only variable you have is T squared, that is the faster way to do it, okay? Okay, number 10, let's go see what that looks like. So this one's a little bit different. Leave that there. This one has a formula. Let me write it down real quick, or it has an equation. And then it tells you that X is between 10 and 25. So this one says the metabolic rate of an, oh God, I can't say that, eco ectothermic organism <laughs> increases with increasing temperature with a certain range. Experimental data for the oxygen consumption C in microliters per gram per hour of a beetle at certain temperatures can be approximated by this model, where X is the air temperature in degrees Celsius. So it says the oxygen consumption is 125 microliters per gram per hour. What is the air temperature? So which letter represents the oxygen consumption? Look at that first sentence at the top. Which letter represents oxygen consumption? So when it says oxygen consumption is 125, what they're saying is that the C equals 125, right? Now it says, what is the air temperature? Which variable in there represents the air temperature? Do you see it? Mm -hmm. So they wanna know what X is, right? They're saying if C is 125, what is X? And so I just wrote that down here. Consumption, our oxygen consumption rep is represented by the letter C. So that is 125. And then it's asking me what is the air um, temperature. So I need to figure out what X is. So all I'm gonna do is plug C into this equation. So I get 125 equal to all of this. And what kind of equation is this? Is it a linear, a quadratic, a cubic? What kind of equation is this? It is a quadratic because of that guy, right? The x squared. And whenever we have a quadratic, we have to get it equal to zero. So I know I've got to do that. And it's not the kind of quadratic where I can do extracting roots. Because if it were, I would be moving the 50 over, right? But I can't do extracting roots because we don't have just x squared. We have x squared and an x, right? So extracting roots is not the way I want to go. Otherwise, you'd have to complete the square first. That's not fun. I don't like completing the square if I don't have to. So we do two other options, which is factoring and the quadratic formula. And with these decimals in here, I wouldn't dare try to factor this, okay? So my best bet is going to be to use the quadratic formula for this one. 
So I get negative 74.25. So in this case, this number is the A, this number is the B, and then this number is the C, right? And so I'm gonna try to go plug it into my formula. So I will get X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus four A C all over two times A. And so I did my parts the way I'm supposed to, right? You're supposed to simplify this stuff. You're supposed to simplify everything inside of there and this in that first step, right? Break it up into its parts. So I did the double negatives. I got the positive 165. I put everything inside the radical in my calculator and ended up with this 136.3725. And then I multiplied the two and the 0.45, okay? Now I've got to take that square root. So square root of 136.3725, we get 0.4. Um, it does have some more decimals, so I'm just doing the dot, dot, dot. And then I've got to split this up actually because I can't do it all in my calculator. So I'm gonna have 1.65 plus this 11.6 number. And then I'm also gonna have 1.65 minus this 11.6 number. Now I'm not even gonna do the second one, I'm just gonna talk about it, okay? The second one, what happens when you subtract, when you take one and you subtract 11? What kind of number do you get? Do you get a positive number or a negative number? You're gonna get a negative 10 point something or a negative nine point something, right? Somewhere around there. So you're gonna get a negative number in the top. The bottom number is a positive. What happens when you divide that negative number, whatever it may be, by that positive 0 0.9? What sign are you gonna get? A negative divided by positive will be a negative. Now, that means that this X value is going to be negative, okay? Look at your bounds for X. Can the X be a negative number? It says X has to be between 10 and 25, doesn't it? There's no negative numbers between 10 and 25, which means whatever this number is, just the fact that it's negative is gonna make it a bad answer, okay? So I don't need to compute that. I mean, you could if you want to and then actually visually see what that negative number is, but it doesn't matter to me what it is because it's bad, it's negative, okay? The other one though, when I take a positive and a positive, I'm gonna get a positive, I'm gonna divide that by a positive, it's still gonna be a positive. So it may be a case that that number lives in here, okay? So let's go see what that looks like. I'm gonna do 1.65 plus, and I don't wanna round this, so I'm just gonna hit second and then the negative symbol so that it puts that whole number in there, the whole thing, even the part I don't see after the six, seven, okay? And then I'm gonna divide that by 0 0.9. You never wanna round in your middle of your steps because it could throw your answer off by a decimal point and then you'll get the problem wrong even though you're doing all your process, okay? I did second and then the negative symbol to get the past answer. And whenever you do that, it just says ants. It also does it if I am just, um, like if I just have that in there as my last answer and I like wanna multiply that by two or something, I could just hit times two and it automatically puts it in there as the answer, okay? Um, but if I wanted that to be second, like let's say I wanted to divide by that, I would say two divided by 
and it doesn't pop up automatically. So I have to hit second and then okay. Okay, um, that was it, right? The total answer? Yeah, I divided by 0.9 already. So then what does it say for me to do on my rounding? It says to one decimal place. Well, this zero is not going to change that. So it's just gonna be 14.8. So this is for part A. I just wrote an A up here. Okay, let's go see what part B says. So part B says, in, oh, I didn't even ask you the question. Was that number between 10 and 25? It was, right? And so that's what makes it okay to say, yes, this is the answer. What if I had done my math and I had found out that this was like, I don't know, 50? What would I have written in the box if that had happened? Right, because both of them would have been bad, right? Okay, let's see. When air temperature increases from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, the oxygen consumption is increased by approximately what factor? Round your answers to one decimal place. So they're telling me the air temperature, right? They're telling me it's 10 here and then it's 20 there and they wanna know it's increased by approximately what factor? So let's go see what it would be at those values. So the first thing I'm gonna do for part B is to plug in X equal to 10, and then eventually I'll plug in X equal to 20. Come on computer. So I'm gonna go into that equation and I'm just gonna plug in a 10. And then over here, I'm gonna do it again, but I'm gonna plug in the 20. So let's see, I'm gonna type the whole thing in my calculator. Minus 1.65 times 10 plus 50.75. I get C equals 79.25. And then I'm gonna do the same thing again, but I'm gonna plug in 20. and I get 197.75. Oops, sorry. Okay, it does say round to one decimal, please. So it says factor, that's the key word. It says it increases by what factor? What that means is they wanna know 79.25 times what factor will equal the 197.75. This guy being the quote unquote factor, right? So how do I figure out what that factor is? Pretend that's an X. How would you solve the equation if it said 79.25 times X? And I think I heard it, divide. So I'm gonna divide both sides by that 79.25 and I figure out that the factor is whatever that is. I think I already put it in my calculator and I get this, but it wants me to round it to one decimal place. So that nine is going to affect that four. So it will be by a factor of 2.5. So that was a tricky part right there. I'm glad we covered this problem because otherwise you probably would have subtracted the two numbers or done something other than this, right? We have to be careful with those words. Our vocabulary is super important, right? I try to use the right vocabulary, but sometimes you hear me, I just say this guy and that guy, and <laughs> I don't use the right words, but we should just so we can get used to them. Coefficient is just such a long word, right? I want to say it every time. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the 1.45. 
or 1.4 and 1.5. It really is just the end part of 1.4 and the end part of 1.5, and I meshed them together because both of those ends had to do with the quadratic formula, okay? So we could do the quadratic formula with real numbers. We could do the quadratic formula with complex numbers. It didn't matter. Um, we just worked it all out. And if it had a negative inside the, the square root, we wrote the little i, right? That's the only difference between the real stuff and the imaginary stuff. Okay. So with all of that said, we are gonna go into, it's a little bit of a break from the quadratics, but we are gonna go back to quadratics tomorrow, okay? Again, don't forget that we are not meeting in person tomorrow, right? I'm taking a personal day. I have to go clean the old department, right? <laughs> so I'm going to pre-record the video tonight. Once I know where we stopped today, I'm going to pre-record it tonight. It'll be uploaded tonight. You can watch it either tonight or tomorrow, tomorrow night, whenever you feel like you want to. But then on Thursday, we're going to start reviewing, okay? So make sure that you at least go in there and look at it and then try the homework as much as you can, okay? Um, but we won't meet in person tomorrow. It'll just be all on the computer, okay? I'd rather do that than have a sub come in here and use different verbiage and confuse everybody and the whole thing, okay? Um, it's just better to be more consistent with the same person um, than to have somebody else come in. I mean, you could either like them better than me or not like them better than me. It doesn't matter. It's just, I want a consistent voice throughout the semester, okay? Okay. Um, so in this section, what we're gonna start doing is just linear equations, but it's not necessarily equations, it's in equations, okay? So inequality. What that means is that in our, in our quote unquote equation, <laughs> in our inequality, instead of there being an equal sign in the middle, like there always has been, right? Now we're gonna have like a greater than or a less than or a greater than or equal, a less than or equal. So these symbols. So this symbol, this symbol, this symbol, or this symbol, right? Those are the ones we're gonna have there instead of the equal sign, okay? So we're gonna show you how do you solve them if you have those and not an equal sign. The process is exactly the same for solving equations. There is one major difference. And that major difference, before I go into this thing, is that if you happen to divide by a negative number, I don't care if the numbers are negative, but if you divide by a negative on both sides, what happens is that this little symbol will flip over or vice versa, depending on what you started with. It just completely flips around, okay? And it doesn't flip around in this direction because if it did that, nothing changes, right? It still looks the same. <laughs> so I have some people going, I flipped it over. No, not that way. You have to flip it over this way, right? So that that way, this one will turn into that one, okay? So don't be a smart aleck, people. <laughs> um, that's the only big difference, okay? So it, of course, it's going to say in its own words what I just said. It says, um, you've used these symbols before in the past just to compare two numbers, like yes, zero is bigger than this or x is bigger than that. Um, but now what we're going to do is actually we're going to solve what are called inequalities, okay? And so if you had just the variable by itself, it basically tells you that the solution to this or what that means is it means all the real numbers that are greater than or equal to three, okay? So you don't just have one solution. Like in an equation, if you solve a linear equation, you get one answer, right? If you solve a quadratic equation, you get two answers, one answer, or zero answers, depending on the problem, right? What this is telling you is you're not gonna get just one answer. You're gonna get a whole group of numbers that meet the statement, okay? So in before we would calculate, we would get one answer. We would go check it to make sure that it meets the statement, right? That it makes the statement true. And then we would say, yeah, that's my answer. But now that's not the case. You can't check your answers here. It's really, really difficult to check your answers here because it's not one answer. It's an infinite number of answers. Um, you just don't know which part of the number line is an answer here. It goes to infinity and negative infinity, right? You don't know if this part is your answer, if this part is your answer, if that part is your answer, if the whole thing is your answer. Which piece of infinity do you have as your solution? 
okay? And so as we solve it, we'll figure out where we are on the number line, okay? Um, so you'll see the equations that look like this. This is a regular inequality where it looks a lot like an equation, right? If I were to imagine this gone and an equal sign being there, it looks exactly like an equation, doesn't it? Okay. This is something that's different, okay? Um, I call it a like a threefold inequality because there's three pieces, not just two sides to the inequality, but there's three of them now, right? We saw in our last problem, this, this expression. Didn't we see that as our bounds for the last problem? That's a triple inequality, okay? This is also a triple inequality. And that probably came from something that looked like this, but they solved this and then they got to that, okay? So you don't get just one thing as your answer. You're basically telling you that everything between 10 and 25 is an answer. 10 itself is an answer because of the bar, because it says it, X can equal 10. 25 itself is an answer because X can equal 25, but anything else in the middle, 14, 10, 10.2, 10.0000000001, right, is going to be in that interval. Anything in there is a solution. There's an infinite number of numbers in that bracket, okay? There's no way you can test an infinite number of things, right? <laughs> it will be there forever. So once you find your solution, just hope that you did everything correct and that you got it. Unfortunately, this is not one of those that you can go check like the equation. So, Let's see how they do it. They say with an equation, you solve an inequality in the variable by finding all values for X, which the inequality is true. Such values are called solutions and are said to satisfy the inequality. The set of all numbers that are solutions of an inequality is called the solution set. So notice we don't get a solution like we did with the equals. Okay, for the solution, you get one number, right? Maybe two, but that's it. Just a finite number of answers. Here, you're gonna get a solution set, which means you're gonna basically get a group of numbers. Now, what that group is gonna look like, I can't talk about it just yet because we haven't gotten there, okay? But, and I don't wanna write it all down and then it be written on the other page. It's happened to me already before, right? <laughs> so let's just wait till we get to that, okay? But for instance, this particular problem, if I were to solve it like a normal equation, what would you do to, if, that, if you pretend that was an equal sign, what would you do? Mm -hmm, minus one on both sides. And so then what I get is I get the X by itself and then four minus one is three. And so that's what they're saying here. The solution set is going to be all real numbers that are less than three. That's exactly what this is. All the X values that are less than three are your answers, all of them. Okay, now the way they write that, and I don't know, there's a few ways to write it. I've seen them write the solution set like this, and it just depends on what book you have. They use a bracket because that denotes a set. And then it's like all X is such that X is less than three. So I've seen this notation, okay? It's basically whatever you got over here, but you add the little braces and then you say X and a bar in front. And the way you read this is all X's or all X values, to be more formal, right? That bar means such that X is less than three, okay? So all X values such that that X value is less than three, okay? So can three be a solution? No, because I have to be strictly smaller than three, right? There's no bar underneath that inequality. If it were this, then yes, three would be included in that set, okay? So little bits of info definitely need to think about. Okay, now that's normally not how we like to write our answers though, just FYI. If, you, if you're a math, anybody in here a math major? I don't think so. I think most of your engineers or something, right? Okay. If you're a math major, you'll see that a lot more. But if you're not, don't worry about it. <laughs> Normally, what we like to do is we like to see the group straightforward. OK? 
Okay, we like to see the visual representation of the group. Now, normally you can do that as a graph. There's also another way to show it visually, and that's called an interval, okay? Um, and so there's two ways to write that answer other than this. One of the ways is to use the graph, and the other way is to write the interval, okay? And so we definitely need to talk about those. So it says the set of all points on the real number line that represents the solution that is called the graph of the inequality. And then graphs have uh, many types of inequalities consist of intervals on the real number line. So each graph coincides with what's called an interval, okay? And I'll show you how to, what the graphs look like, how to figure them out, and then what the intervals should look like. Um, it says review the nine basic types of intervals on the real number line. Note that each type of interval can be classified as bounded or unbounded. Bounded means you have this symbol or this symbol. Unbounded means, no, I'm lying. I am lying. Okay. Bounded means you have no infinities in your interval. Okay. Unbounded Line, I'm saying it the other way around. No, oh, yeah, you're right. Like I'm guessing myself, stop it. <laughs> and this one can have infinity, negative infinity, or both. Which makes sense, right? If it's unbounded, it could go forever, right? Okay. And the other one, when I say no infinity is plural, I mean no infinity or negative infinity, okay? Like that. Okay, so as long as the interval doesn't have the little infinity symbol in it, it's called the bounded interval. If you do see an infinity, whether it's positive or negative, in your set, in your interval, it's considered unbounded. So let's see here. It doesn't give me all the little things. There are nine of them. Where are they? They don't tell me them. See, I was waiting because I thought they were going to tell me them, and then they don't. Let me go put them over here. <laughs> here are the nine different ones. I hope there's nine. So the first one is everything, the whole number line, negative infinity to infinity, right? That's one. What happens if I don't have the whole number line, but just the left side of the number line? So some number there, but then everything from that number all the way to negative infinity. What does this look like in a graph? In a graph, this means everything from negative infinity to infinity, the whole number line. What does this one mean? This one means from that number A to infinity. Now notice that I used a parentheses there. That means that there's gonna be a parentheses here. And notice how that's the parentheses that's next to the A, and that's the same direction of the parentheses I used, right? So the parentheses match on the A. The next one is what if I go the other side? Negative, or I'm sorry, A to positive infinity. So now you've got this number line. And you've got that number A, but now I'm going to positive infinity. And notice this is the parentheses that's next to A. So I need to put my parentheses in that direction. Okay. The other option dun, 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 is if I'm going between A and B. There's no parent, there's no infinities whatsoever on this guy. But here's the number A, here's the number B, and I'm only in between them. And on A, my parentheses needs to look like this. And on B, my parentheses needs to look like that. So far, so good. Okay, I'm gonna repeat all of the same stuff, but I'm gonna put a bracket. You cannot put brackets on infinity because the bracket is the representation for that bar, right? I told you about the inequalities and sometimes they have that little bar underneath them, right? If it has that bar underneath it, it means that there's gonna, you're gonna use a bracket instead of a parenthesis, this simple. 
So if you have this symbol, it's probably because one of your inequalities had the bar underneath it, okay? Whereas if you're using these, those use the parentheses, okay? The way I remember is if there's a little bar, then I need to make them straight, right? Not curvy, okay? But another way I remember, infinities will never have brackets because you aren't these guys curve, curvy. And so to me, I'm like, these guys are curvy, the ends need to be curvy, okay? That's how I remember it. But in all honesty, that's not why, <laughs> right? The reason why is because you can never equal infinity. Infinity is not a number. Infinity is a direction, okay? It just means it keeps going forever in the positive direction or it keeps going forever in the negative direction. It's not actually a number. You can't actually equal infinity, okay? And because I can't equal infinity, it can never have a bracket on it, okay? But if I do have this, this is just a number. I can equal whatever that number is, okay? And so then in that case on the number line, it's gonna look like this, but with a bracket instead of a parentheses. Okay, and the same goes if it's on the other side and then the positive infinity. Remember, the infinity will never have the bracket. It will always have the little curvy parentheses. But the number here does have a bracket that looks like this. Now I also have from A to B with brackets. Here's A, here's B. I am in between A and B, but A should have a bracket that looks like that, and B should have a bracket that looks like that. It says nine of them. I only have how many? Seven? I'm missing two. The only way you can have a little two is if it's half and half. Okay, so I have A and B, but maybe I have that side with the parentheses and that side with the bracket, or the reverse. A has a bracket and B has a parenthesis, okay? And so in this case, here's your A, here's your B. Here's your A, here's your B. Notice that if wherever these are, isn't negative infinity on the left and positive infinity on the right? Negative infinity is on the left. This A value is on the right. A is on the left. Infinity is on the right, A is on the left, B is on the right. It's very straightforward, you see, okay? So don't mix them up. Here I'm gonna have this symbol for the A because that's what's next to the A. And then here I'm gonna have this symbol on the B because that's what's next to the B. And I'm gonna shade everything in between those guys. Here it's the opposite. So put the bracket and then the parentheses and shade everything in between. So see how these are groups of answers, right? It's not just one number. It's like everything inside that red line is an answer. Any tiny little thing in there is an answer, okay? So those are the nine different equalities. This is super important. Um, I don't think you're going to be given this information when it comes to the test. So if you're gonna memorize something, this is probably what you need to memorize, okay? You have to know this. Some of you may have seen it before, some of you may have not. If you have never seen these things, definitely commit them to memory, okay? Okay, so now that we have those magic informations, <laughs> we can actually use all of that to do these, although I would rather not because I want you to memorize it, right? So it says, write an inequality to represent each interval. Then state whether the interval is bounded or unbounded. So this is something totally different. I have to add more to this table here. <sighs> this, you would say, this is a weird symbol, but this symbol means all real numbers, okay? And so if that happens to be your answer, that all real numbers is your answer, then this is the way the interval looks and that's the way the solution, the graph looks, right? Here, you're going to say X is less than A and that's the interval that matches this and the graph that matches this. Here, you're gonna say X is greater than
and A. Also notice the arrow and the red shaded region. Doesn't this arrow point to the left? And doesn't the shaded region point to the left? Right? This one points to the right and that shaded region goes to the right, okay? This one's a little bit different. You have X in the middle between A and B. And didn't I shade between A and B? So they all kind of like match, right? Makes sense. Over here, it says X is less than or equal to A. So it's got the bracket because there's a bar. Same thing here. This is X is greater than or equal to A. Here you have X in the middle, but you have these symbols. Just FYI, these symbols are always less than. Notice whenever I write X in the middle, they are always less than. Okay. If you somehow solve the equation and you had to um, divide by a negative and you had to flip it over, they're going to turn it to greater than, right? You can't type that in as your answer. You have to change it. And I'll show you how we get there. Okay. Here, this one has no bar, but this one does have a bar. Here, the A has the bar, but the B does not. Right? Bar means bracket, no bar means a parenthesis. Okay. So now we have all three. That's a big table. But we have every single situation that you can imagine. You have what it looks like as an inequality, you have what it looks like as an interval, and then what it looks like as a graph. Okay, all of them are there. So when it tells me to write this one as an interval. I'm obviously between negative three and five, aren't I? So when I write this, I'm going to have to write X in between negative three and five. Now, I did mention to you that this has to be a less than. You don't have a choice. It has to be a less than. It doesn't make sense if you put greater than. So I just have to figure out whether they have bars or not. For number or for letter A, which one or any of them have a bar? Five, because it has a bracket, right? So that one is gonna have the bar there. And then you state whether or not it is bounded or unbounded. Does it have any infinities in it? No, so this one is gonna be called bounded. I know the answers are at the bottom, but I'm still gonna talk it out. And then I'll just, whatever. <laughs> now here, there's no two numbers. So it's not X is in between. It's X is going from negative three to infinity, isn't it? And this is actually bad, bad notation. This should not be a bracket. Whoever did this had a typo in there. Didn't I tell you there should never be a bracket on infinity? So that's a typo. I created this, so I obviously did that, but I copied and pasted it from somewhere. So wherever I copied and pasted it from, <laughs> had it bad and I didn't change it, sorry. Okay, so if it looks like that, it's going all the way to infinity. Infinity means I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So this means X has to be greater than negative three. But is it going to have a bar? Pay attention to what's next to the negative three. If it's a parenthesis, does this have a bar? No. And did the interval have an infinity in it? It did. So this one is called unbounded. Essentially, all the ones that just have like a single inequality, those guys are the ones that are unbounded. And then the ones that have the triples, those are the bounded ones. Okay, because they don't have infinities, right? Let's go to the next one, zero to two. So I am gonna have X in between zero and two. I have to use the symbols. Is any of them gonna have a bar? Both are gonna have the bar because both zero has a bracket and two has a bracket. Again, no infinity. So this one is considered bounded. That one is infinity and infinity. This is the weird one. Um, you could write it as uh, an inequality, and the way it looks is, I should have done it up there too. I just say this, but apparently they like you to write it like this. 
right? These are both parentheses and you are between negative infinity and infinity. So they want it to write like that. But the fact that there's infinities means this is unbounded. So just for reference in the notes, I'm going to write that just in case somebody wants to use that as their like note sheet. That you have the interval there too. But these are the same thing. Again, if you're, if you, let me or not people. This is all real numbers. This is integers for some reason. I don't know why they use a Z. That's the natural numbers, which means one, two, three, four, five, like the counting numbers. Um, and then I think you have a W for your whole numbers. There's another one. I can't remember. Or like the irrational, and irrational, and all of that. But they have symbols that represent all of them. So we got these same answers that they had at the bottom. It just matches all the same. Now let's go into these properties here. So the properties are basically the same as the inequality properties. So all the properties are similar to the properties of equations. Solve it just like you would an equation, okay? Only difference is, is if you multiply or divide, and normally we never multiply by a negative number. The only time we ever multiply by anything is if we have fractions, right? And normally our denominators are never negative because it's not formal to put negatives in the denominator, right? So we never really multiply by negative numbers ever, okay? However, our very last step is to divide. And if that coefficient is negative, we do divide by a negative, right? So normally we do this. This one we don't usually do, but if for some reason you did, you have to make sure that you change the direction of the inequality, okay? So that means if I have this, okay? And let's say I have that. I have to solve for x by dividing both sides by a negative two. Because I divided both sides by a negative two, this symbol has to flip over like that. It doesn't matter what the answer is. What matters is what you are doing. So I could have had that over there. And when I divide by that negative two, I don't care that this turns into a positive four. That doesn't mean that the symbol stays the same. No, it does not. If you put a negative downstairs here, that has to flip over the other way, okay? If for some reason, let's say, let's say this was your problem. I guess that might be a case where you might multiply by a negative, right? Because you want to multiply by the common denominator, but you're like, hey, if I'm going to multiply by two to get rid of the two, I might as well multiply by the negative at the same time and get rid of the negative, right? So you'll say, okay, well, I'll multiply this side by a negative two, and I'll multiply this side by a negative two. That'll cancel out the twos, it'll cancel out the negatives, and one X can just be written as X. And over here, you get a negative eight. But the fact that you multiplied by a negative two means that you have to flip over that symbol, okay? So there is times where you might, but it just doesn't happen very often, okay? Um, so they're just doing the same thing here, but with regular numbers. Um, Notice that if you don't, negative two is less than five, is it not, right? And if you multiply both sides by a negative number, you get this. Now, but if you don't flip, here they flip the symbol. Notice they flipped it, right? Is this still a true statement? Six is greater than negative 15, is that true? But what happens if I didn't flip it? If I would have kept it looking like that, is six less than negative 15? No, right? And so that's why they're saying, if you don't flip it, you're going to get the wrong answer because it doesn't make sense anymore, okay? It's harder to tell when it's X, right? You don't know what the heck X is. <laughs> so you can't tell whether it's true or false, but they're letting you know that if you just use regular numbers, it doesn't work if you don't flip that symbol over, okay? So make sure you flip these guys over. So here, we already talked about that one. We just subtracted two, right, on both sides. We got X. Did I 
even though there's a negative down here, did I multiply or divide by that negative? No, I was just subtracting, right? So I don't need to flip anything over if I'm just adding or subtracting, okay? I don't even need to flip anything over if I'm multiplying or dividing by a positive. It's only when I multiply or divide by a negative that it has to flip, okay? That's the only time. So what the heck is it talking about now? Oh, they want us to put things together. I have never used these properties like ever. I think I probably used them when I was like far into my mathematics and I had to prove this crap. You basically take, we're taking algebra, right? After algebra is pre-cal and then it's calculus. If you're a math major, you have to start back over at one plus one equals two. And you basically have to prove every single property you've ever seen from then all the way to the end. So that's why people are always like, how do you remember all these things? I'm like, I literally had to sit there and prove it, <laughs> that it was true. You know what I mean? For every single X value ever. Um, and that's the only time I've ever seen this stuff ever. I don't think I've ever used the transitive property other than that or the addition of inequalities, but I'm just going to skip over that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this one you can do. You do add constants to both sides. We did that, right? When you subtract on both sides, it's the same thing. When you add on both sides, it's the same thing. All it's letting you know is that you can do that. You can multiply by a number. Even if that number is a fraction, it's the same thing as dividing, okay? So they're just letting you know that you do, you are able to do this. You just have to be careful though, if what you're multiplying or dividing by is a negative, then that symbol has to flip over, right? You know that. If it's the positive, it doesn't flip over. Notice it's the same less than symbol. Okay, and all of these properties, these are the two that we're gonna use the most. Um, all of these properties, I know they use the less than symbol to describe the property, but all those properties apply whether it's a less than, a greater than, a less than or equals, or a greater than or equals, okay? So it doesn't matter what kind of symbol you have here, it's going to be the same, okay? And if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative, whatever that symbol is, is going to flip over. Okay. So in here, they're just doing the same thing all over again. They're saying what I'm saying, but like in a long, long way. <laughs> but all they're saying is that you can do it with the bars underneath as well. So here we go. The simplest type of inequality looks like that. That's fantastic. They can get more complicated. I could start putting fractions in there. I could do whatever I want to it as long as it stays a linear, right? No more powers on X. So how would you solve this guy? I just want to do it for practice. How would you solve this inequality? Mm -hmm. On both sides, and then what do you get? What do I get on the left side? What do I get on the right side? Not four. Yeah, okay. And then what about the symbol? Does it stay the same or does it flip? Right, I have not multiplied or divided by anything negative. All I've done is subtract. Now, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. And so then I get X, this does not reduce, so it's gonna stay a one half. And do I need to flip over my symbol? No, we divided, but not by a negative, right? Cool, same thing here, you have this equation, what would you do first? I know they tell you everything, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what would you do first? When you're solving regular equations, the usually the first thing you want, you always wanna get all of your variables on one side and then your constants on the other side. And it don't matter whether it's an equal, or less than, greater than, whatever, all these different symbols we know about now, right? Doesn't matter what's in the middle. The goal for linear equations is always to get the letters on the left and the numbers on the right, okay? So if I wanna get all my X's over here on the left, I gotta move this three X over. How do we do that? I have the answer there. Mm -hmm. Subtract three X from each side, right? And so when you do that, they go away from there. Here you get the two X, this guy came down, that guy came down. Then you gotta get the constants all on the other side. So now I have to add seven to each side. 
When I do that, the seven's gone. I just have a two X and then nine plus seven is the 16. The last thing you would do, I know it tells you, but what would you do? <laughs> Divide by two now, right? And so then it's eight now, X is by itself. Did I ever multiply or divide by a negative? Never. So you notice that symbol never flips over, ever. Okay. And this is the actual um, answer. Now, remember, the solution set is, the way you say this, is all real numbers that are greater than eight. So this is in words. So all of that is just this in words. But instead of writing it in words, we usually like to see the visual representation of it, right? And so that's when they use the, in the this thing here. So if it's everything bigger than eight, then that means it's eight all the way to positive infinity, okay? We know infinities always have to have a parentheses. And what symbol is next to the eight? Does it have a bar? No, so it's another parentheses on the eight, okay? Oh, and then they're graphing it. It's easy to graph whenever, it doesn't matter if you have this. I don't like that. I don't know why they do that, okay? Me personally, I like to get my solution, which looks like this right here. Then I like to graph it, which is this right here. And then after I've graphed it, I like to write the interval. I do them in that order, okay? For some reason, they did it the other way. They gave you the solution set first, and then now they're giving you the graph. And I just usually don't work that way. Because this, I can write on a number line. If you're telling me X is greater than eight, then I know that means from eight and everything bigger than it, right? So it goes in that direction. What's in this direction? An infinity, right? Positive infinity. And then because there's no bar, I would know that it would have to be a parenthesis. It wouldn't make sense for me to put a parenthesis there because that would mean I'm going in that direction, right? So it would make sense that the parenthesis goes in this direction so that I can go that way. And then literally all you're doing is putting the eight on the left, the infinity on the right, this symbol here, and what does infinity always get? Parentheses, okay? And so to me, it helps me to put this in a graph first and then write the interval. Because then I know exactly who goes on the left, who goes on the right, and the symbols that go around them, okay? So as we're doing these examples, you'll see me do that, okay? I'll get the answer, then I'll do the graph, and then I'll do the interval, okay? Although in WebAssign, they might ask you for the graph answer on top and then the interval answer on the bottom, just be, or the other way around. Interval answer first and then the graph second. I don't know why they do it backwards. Okay. Oh, this is why they wanted to, to learn that stupid property I wanted to skip. <laughs> it's letting you know that if you have this word, right? If you have the word and, okay? If you have the word and, you should be able to combine it into one inequality, okay? That's what it's telling us. So when we see this, this is like my A, this is my B, that's the same thing, isn't it? And then that's my C. What it's saying is that I can just basically cut out the middle guy and say that A has to be, or no, you can't cut him out. You have to include him. But you basically combine them. So that becomes just B once in the middle, the C over here and the A over there. And that's exactly what they've done. They put the A on the left side, they put this seven, which is the C on the right side. And this guy that repeats in the middle, they put it in the middle, okay? So they combined it. We normally only have to do that when we have um, word problems. However, personally, I do not do that. I just solve this, I solve this, and then I see where the two things overlap and that's my answer. I'll show you how to do that. Okay, but that's normally how though I do those problems. So I'm gonna use this one as an example because I noticed that they don't go into it, this triple thing. So for me, this is the best way I can advise you to solve these triple ones, okay? 
is if you cover up the left-hand side, now it looks like a normal thing, right? What would you do to solve that if you didn't have that other side over there? What would be your first step? Plus two. And normally you do plus two to quote unquote both sides, right? But I have an extra side, don't I? So you just have to make sure you do plus two over there as well, okay? So then I get negative four. I have a five X all by itself in the middle now. And now I have a nine over here. Do it again. Each time you're gonna do something. What would I do next? Divide by five on both sides. Kind of leading into the words here. This does not reduce, so I get negative four fifths. The fives do cancel, so I get X, and that does not reduce, so it stays nine fifths. Okay. I did. Um, oh, you're right. Who said that? Zillion. Zillion. So I'm supposed to add those, right? <laughs> I did not do that. Good, good, good. Now, on a number line, what does that look like? It looks like a shaded region between negative two-fifths and nine-fifths. This side having a bar means it'll have a bracket. This side not having a bar means it'll be a parenthesis, right? Now, that's if you knew how to combine these into one. If you learn that and you, you're good with it and you never make a mistake, then go ahead, by all means, do it that way, okay? It is shorter, it's faster. But for me, I just don't ever remember that property. It's not one of the ones that I have like in the back of my mind all the time, okay? So what I do is I solve the equation separately. And notice that in order for you to solve them separately, you still have to do those same two steps, right? You have to add two on both sides for both. You have to divide by five on both sides for both. So if I add two, I get this. And if I divide by five, I get that two fifths like we just had. Over here, if I add two, and then if I divide by five, I get X. Oops, no bar. Nine fifths, okay? If I graph this one, because it does say the word and, right? If it says the word and in between the two things, that means you want to figure out where the two graphs overlap. Sometimes later, you're gonna get to the word or, and then when you get to the word or, it's not where the graphs overlap, but it's like everything that the two graphs cover. So you basically transpose both graphs onto one graph and all of it is your answer, okay? But for and, the word and, it's only where the two images overlap. So I'm gonna have to draw this thing twice and then I'm gonna have an actual answer. And so to be consistent, I'm gonna say that the left-hand side is the negative two fifths and the right-hand side is the nine fifths, okay? I just don't want to squeeze in negative two fifths and negative two fifths down here, and then nine fifths and nine fifths. So it's the same number, right? Now, this one says everything X is actually bigger. So the alligator wants to eat the bigger thing, right? So X is bigger than negative two fifths. So that means it's going this direction, okay? And what kind of symbol is here? A parenthesis or a bracket? Because of the bar, good. Now over here, it says X is less than nine fifths. So that means here's nine fifths and I'm going in this direction, okay? And nine fifths gets a parentheses or a bracket. Parentheses. Now, where do the two things overlap? They overlap right here, don't they? Come on, pin, work. There we go. That's where they overlap, isn't it? And so if I write that down, there's a bracket there. So I've got to put a bracket here. There's a parentheses there. So I'm going to put a parentheses there and I'm just going to scribble what's in the middle. That's where they overlap. Is that the same answer? It is the same exact answer, okay? So the reason why I like to do it this way is because if it's and, you can combine it into one. But if I put the word or in between those two statements, you cannot combine them into one. Also, if this doesn't match that, excuse me, 
you also cannot combine them into one. So why should I learn that method just for this special case, right? I'd rather learn a method that works no matter what's going on, whether it's the word and in the middle, whether it's the word or in the middle, and whether or not those two things match. This is the process that you do if I'd rather you learn this one than that one, okay? This is what I'm trying to get at, okay? This one's very specific to a special case. I could apply this method to all of the double equations, okay? I'm pretty sure, I hope there's more of those so you can see what happens when you got that word or in the middle. Um, but they're not, they're gonna jump straight into inequality, dang it. I'll go look at that one. Um, okay, so when you're doing, these are the same thing as equations except you have the absolute value now in the picture. So we still don't have any squares or anything like that, but we do have the absolute value bars, okay? Now, in order for those to happen, you have to have these special relationships. I don't know how something, I'm breathing in something and it's making me like almost gag, but I have a mask on, so it doesn't make sense what I would be breathing in. Um, okay, this box you will have. So on the test, in your notes, you will have this information. This is not something you have to memorize. If they give it to you in a box in here, I'll put it on the test. Normally people just don't memorize them. I, of course, can memorize them, but it's because I've seen them 10 million times, right? I haven't, I'm not just learning it, okay? But you do need to know these relationships because depending on which situation you have, that's going to tell you how you're going to write it. Yay, I finally got to that word or. So it does pop in this word or. So we know that when we use the word and, we graph them both and we see where they overlap, right? Here, when you graph them both, it has the word or. So you don't do where they overlap. You actually do where the two graphs come together. And I'll show you how to do that, okay? So let's see this in action, okay? Now this one has the bars and then it has less than two. Now, also one thing I need to know, need to pay attention to because I'm pretty sure they're gonna do it to me. Did they do it to me? No, they don't do it to me. But you can have a problem that has like this. If that's my problem, I cannot apply this rule yet. Because notice that over here, it doesn't have a number in the front of that bars, does it? So I can't have a number in the front. So if you have numbers in the front or if you're adding something over here, you have to get rid of these things first and make it so that you just have the bars equal to whatever you get over here on the side. Make sure that you isolate the absolute value bars before you apply one of these rules. And that's not something that will be mentioned on the note sheet. So that's just something you have to remember. In order for you to apply these puppies, the bars have to be by themselves, okay? So fortunately though for us, I don't know about the homework. I haven't gone to go look. But so far for us, it doesn't look like we have any extra pieces outside of our bars, right? For part A, it's just the bars less than two. And then for part B, it's the bars greater than seven, greater than or equal to seven. So when it's less than, you can actually tear this into one of those triple inequalities. Whatever's in the inside has to go in the middle. This same expression is right here. Right? The only thing extra that they're adding is the fact that you took it out of the bars means that that could also be a negative two. And when you do that, you already know that with the triples, you have to have these same symbols, right? They have to be less than, I mentioned that. But because we know that this inside could probably be a negative two and it'll still come out to be positive two, you have to include that negative two in your solution, okay? 
So, and you don't have to memorize that. You can just apply it. Notice what's happening. Whatever was in the bars is there in the middle. Whatever that number is, is negative over here and positive over there. And then you always have a less than symbol. There's something in here. What about this? Notice that these say they only apply when A is greater than zero. Why? What happens if A is less than zero? Then that means this is a negative number, right? It doesn't make sense when it's a negative number um, because if you're doing the absolute values, what are you gonna get? A positive, right? Is a positive ever less than a negative number? Positive numbers are never negative, less than negative numbers. So that's why they don't have these rules for when the A is negative, okay? They just, there's no solutions to those things, okay? So I'm letting you know that because I, I can't promise, but I'm pretty sure in the homework, it's gonna have a problem like this. And it's gonna say less than negative two. And then you know that this is automatically no solution. It's not, doesn't fit one of these descriptions here. So it's not going to have a solution, OK? OK, back to this guy. Solving it, I'm going to add 5 to all three sides. And when we're done, those cancel. We have x all by itself. In the graph, I would graph that. I would put 3 here, 7 here, because that's where they are on the number line. And I would shade everything in between. And for three, I would have a parentheses. And for seven, I would have a parentheses. And that's exactly where they got this interval from. Notice that my interval matches my graph exactly. Right? OK, part B has this symbol. And so then. Um, that means I need to tear it up into the x plus three less than or equal to negative seven or the inside greater than or equal to seven. I'm using that rule from the rules that were in the box up on the other page, right? If I minus three on both sides here, I get x by itself and a negative 10. If I minus three on both sides of this, I get x and then I get a positive four, okay? They like to write it on the side. You've seen me, I like to write it underneath, right? It doesn't matter. You get the same answers. Now, this is where I was telling you, if you graph both of them, you can get your final answer, okay? And I have the word or in between now. So the word or is not where they overlap, but um, I don't know how to say it. What word do they use? Not overlap. I'm just going to see both. You have to put both of them on the number line. So I want to put the same numbers here and here so that it stays consistent and lined up. That helps me to see where it overlaps if I put those same numbers all the way down on all three graphs. Okay. Now, which number should be on the left and which one should be on the right? You have negative 10 and you have positive 4. So which one should be on the left on the number line and which one should be on the right? Mm -hmm. And then the four on the right, right? Okay. Try to squeeze it in there. So for this inequality, you're saying X has to be less than negative 10, which means everything in this direction. And there is a bar, so I'm going to put a bracket. Okay. This one says X is greater than four. So that means from four and everything bigger, and it has a bracket, so I'm going to use, or it has a bar, so I'm going to use a bracket. Now, when I say put both of them on your answer, I'm literally taking this exact thing and just bringing it to the bottom, taking this one and bringing it to the bottom, okay? This is my graph solution. But how the heck do I put that in intervals, right? You've got two separate intervals, don't you? You have this one, which goes to what's over here at this arrow? 
Mm -hmm. And what's over here on this arrow? Yep. So when I write this interval, it's going to be negative infinity to negative 10. And what has to go here? Yep. And over here, I've got four on the left, infinity on the right. This one obviously gets a bracket. What does this one automatically get? Mm -hmm. And to tell the reader that both of them are part of my answer together, not just this one or that one, it's both of them are part of my solution, you use this union symbol in between. And that's all they're talking about down here, okay? So in order for me to tell them that both pieces are part of my full complete answer, you just put a union in between the two pieces, okay? This is the interval solution. So you've got it in its inequality form, you've got it in its graphed form, and then you've got it in its interval form. Okay, now this one's a word problem. So it says, consider the two cell phone plans shown in figure 1.15. The plan A says you pay $4.99 per month and then you pay uh, for 500 minutes. So when you pay this 50 bucks per month, you're automatically getting the 50 minutes, right? But you have to pay 40 cents for each additional minute above that 500, okay? Then plan B is you pay $45.99 per month for the first 50, 500 minutes, but then you have to pay 45 cents for each additional minute above the 500, okay? It's gonna get a little tricky with that 500 in there. So it says, how many additional minutes must you use in one month for plan B to cost more than plan A? So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna write an expression for this and you wanna write an expression for that. And then you wanna use this more than information to write the inequality, okay? I'm running out of time, I'm trying to get there. Okay, so I am gonna have to pay 49.99 no matter what, right? But when it comes to paying the 40 cents, I only have to pay the 40 cents for any minutes that I go above the 500, okay? So however many minutes I have, I've used, this is the minutes used. I have to subtract the 500 from it first, right? Because I already paid for those 500 minutes using the 49.99, right? So you have to compensate for that. You have to put that in there, okay? So be careful because when it asks me how many additional minutes, it means however many minutes I used minus the 500 I already paid for, okay? So when I write my answer, I'm gonna have to figure out what this value is once I know what X is, okay? Now this one is different. I only pay 45.99, but then I have to pay 45 cents for all my minutes over 500. And so then now they're telling me, well, what if it's more than? Pay attention to which one is which. It says plan B has to be more than plan A. Which symbol do you think would represent more than? The greater than or the less than? Mm -hmm. So it's going to actually be the greater than symbol, okay? Now there's four different ways you can say this. You can say more than, that's going to be a greater than. There's less than, which is pretty straightforward, right? It's gonna be less than. Then there's at most, which is the most confusing, and at least. These are the most confusing because they're not straightforward, okay? At most means that or less, right? at most means that number or less. So it actually means less than or equal to. And then at least means that number or anything bigger than it, okay? So then this one is greater than or equal to. So those are the ones that are harder because 
They don't sound, you don't use the symbol that it sounds like. You see most and you're thinking bigger, right? You see least and you're thinking smaller, but it's not. It's at most. So you can have at most $500 in your bank account. That means you could have 500 or anything smaller than that, right? But those are all the phrases that you'll see with the word problems here, okay? But I do need to do plan B greater than plan A. So what that means is it means this expression, oops, not that one, the plan B expression, greater than the plan A expression. Oh, I can't fit it in there, but you know what's over there. It's supposed to be 0 0.40 times X minus 500. Notice what they have here, how in the world, yeah, that's wrong, I'm not even gonna go there. Just don't look at that. So what I need to do is I need to solve this guy. The first thing I need to do is distribute those 0.45s. So 0 0.45 times X is 0 0.45. A positive times a negative is gonna be a negative. 0 0.45 times 500 is 225, 49.99 plus 0.4 times x is 0 0.4x, 0.4 times 500 is going to be 200. I can combine my like terms on each side, so this guy and this guy. I get negative 179.01. And then this guy and this guy can combine. Then I need to start moving everything over. So I'm going to subtract 0.4x on both sides. That's going to give me 0.05x. And I'm also in the same step going to add the 179. 0 0.01 so that that can go away. Negative 150.01 plus 179.01. I get 29. I divide by 0 0.05. Do I need to flip over my symbol? No. Because I did not divide by a negative, did I? Okay. Now, that's how many minutes I used, right? This is the number of minutes used. But how many of that is over the 500? We still have to figure out what X minus 500 is, right? And you get that 80. They did it without calculating the, um, the 500 in it but I promise there's gonna be situations where this is not going to work. So that's why I want you to do it the other way, okay? But we do get the same answer as they do. And we actually get that X would have to be more than those 80. And in the computer, it already has this whole word for you, all of that phrase. All it has is a box here and they want that number, okay? So in the computer, it just has it all. And on a test, you have everything already, right? It's multiple choices. So you have what all the solutions are gonna look like. Okay, so these are the practice ones. They're not too bad. What would I do to solve this inequality? Divide both sides by negative eight. If I do that, does the symbol flip over? Yes, and then what is 12 divided by negative eight? I get fraction form negative three halves. So then I like to do the graph first. Only number I have is negative three halves. And if X is supposed to be less than negative three halves, which side am I shading? X has to be less. So all my answers need to be less than negative three halves, 
Am I shading the left side or the right side? Because mm -hmm. these numbers are less than negative three halves, right? And these numbers over here would be bigger than three halves, negative three halves. So I got to shade that direction. I know there's a negative infinity there. What symbol goes here? Is it a bracket or a parentheses? Parentheses. And since I'm going in that direction, I want this to open in that direction. And so then in the interval, it's exactly this negative infinity on the left negative three halves on the right, parentheses here, what automatically goes there? Parentheses. How do we solve this guy? No, we don't need to do that. It's just one inequality. Yeah, you can minus 4x on both sides. I usually like my letters on the left-hand side, but that's okay. You're going to actually make me get to a good teaching point. What is 7x minus 4x? Positive 3x. And then what would you do next? Minus 3. You get 6. You get 3x. And then what do I do next? Divide by 3. So one thing you do by doing it this way is you avoid having to flip over that symbol because you don't get a negative x, right? However, all those nine things that I showed you, none of them had the x on the right-hand side. Not a single one of them had an x on the right-hand side. So if you end up with the x on the right-hand side, you have to change this to so that it can be on the left-hand side, okay? When I do that, you have to make sure that this is still pointing in the correct direction, okay? The fact that I swapped them over means I need to swap over that symbol as well, okay? Another way you can think about it is if this was open to the X, it needs to stay open to the X. You can't just change that, okay? So they, these are two equivalent statements. It's just this one we've never seen before, so we don't know how to graph it, right? Um, you could read it, but you have to read it backwards, right? X has to be the bigger one than two, right? But here it makes more sense. X is greater than or equal to two. You read it a lot better. So if I graph that, greater than two means the left side or the right side? The right side. And then that is going to infinity. What kind of symbol do I put on the two? Bracket, and it's gonna face this direction. And so then my interval is gonna be two, infinity, a bracket here, and what automatically goes there? Parentheses. So always do that if you swap them. Also another thing, just note, if for some reason you had an equation, I'm just gonna make one up, okay? Let's pretend I had this. And then I would have to divide by negative three to get the X alone, right? If I do that, this turns to one, this turns to X, and this turns to negative two. But because I divided by a negative three, what happens to these symbols? They flip. And so now this is going in this direction. And I told you that you cannot have them going in that direction, didn't I? So you're gonna have to do the same thing like we did over there. We're gonna have to flip it all around. So you basically take the whole thing and you flip it over that way. So the negative two comes over here, the one comes over here. Now you have the left hand symbols. You just have to put the bars back where they belong. So who's supposed to have the bar? Mm -hmm. Between the one and the X. So in between the one and the X is where I had the bar, right? So between the one and the X, I need to put that bar back in there, okay? You know they have to turn less than, but make sure you put the bars back where they belong. Okay. And then that I can graph, right? Between negative two and one, that's what I'm going to graph. Okay. So just again, if you have to switch them, switch them. Oh, look, and I have to do it down here. You made up a whole problem. What would you do first? Is that problem? There's two things you could do first. Either of them are going to lead you in two different directions, but both of them are correct. Okay. That's one way. So negative one 
and then you distribute the negative so it turns into negative x and plus four. The other way to do it is just to go ahead and get rid of this negative just straight from the beginning and divide by negative one. Okay. That would give me a positive one. And because I divided by a negative, I have to flip, right? But those would be gone. And this would have to flip and negative 13. Here, if you did it this way, what would be your next step? Cover that up if you have to. What should you do first? Subtract four, subtract four, and just make sure you do it to the other side. So that's gone. I have negative x in the middle. I have negative five here, and over here I have nine. What would you do next? You have to get x completely by itself. If that was a three in the front, what would you do with it? Divide by it, right? So we're gonna divide by negative one, good. So you get a positive five, you get a negative nine, and because I put a negative at the bottom, these things have to flip over. What happens over here? If I had chose to not distribute and chose to get rid of that negative one at the beginning, I would still have to add the four, wouldn't I? And so I still get five, this weird symbol, the X by itself, and then the negative nine over there. So regardless of which way your brain wants to do it automatically, you could still get there as long as you do everything correctly, okay? Now, fantastic, it's the same answer, but is that what I'm gonna type in the computer? And I can't type that in the computer, right? I have to put it the other way around. These have to be less than with the X in the middle. So then the negative nine has to go over here and the bigger number has to go over there. Where should the bar be? Between the X and the five, you got it. And so then graphically, there would be a negative nine here, a five there, all my X's are in between. This one should have parentheses because there's no bar. And this one should have a bracket because there is a bar. So then my interval is gonna be parentheses, negative nine, five in a bracket. And it doesn't matter which way you did it, you're still gonna get that same solution, okay? Oh, I have like a tiny bit of minutes left. We'll just stop. <laughs> we'll do the little bit next time. It'll help us practice too before we go into the next second. Okay. So remember, I'm gonna pre-record this. So I'm gonna continue from number four, number five. I'm also gonna go through the homework and see if there's anything weird in there that we haven't covered. And if there is, I'm gonna talk about those things first before I get into the 1.8, okay? But other than that, you guys have a good day and I hope to see you on Thursday for the review.